and uh, Frankie Dale Brown, who's written a book called Understanding Pietism. And uh, I was reviewing some notes I had made from that book. He, um, he says the five key areas where pietism really impacts are church, with its understanding that the invisible church is more significant than the creeds, that, that the inner or invisible life of the church is, is key. The second is Bible, that uh, the whole area of Bible is just so critical for pietism, uh, particularly the inner meaning of the text, not just the objective but the spiritual meaning of the text. The third, Christian life. Uh, Here's where the born-again vocabulary emerges. It's not enough just to be, uh, to have what, would, what sometimes theologians used to call historic faith, but saving faith. Historic faith is something even Satan has, you know, and James mentions that the demons have faith, uh, and they tremble. They have so much faith. They, but it's historic faith. They don't have saving faith. And then fourth area, Holy Spirit, uh, where you get into the whole question of the heart, the will, and the struggle, and all of that. And then the fifth was the world. And um, really the whole second coming emphasis, uh, which triggered a strong interest in mission work, is um, a pietist uh, uh, contribution. Uh, I forgot to mention that um, Bartholomew Ziegenbalg, uh, that's Z-I-G-E-N-B-A-L-G, was the first missionary to India from Europe, uh, 1724, long before William Carey. I mean, very often Carey is m mentioned as the first Protestant missionary sent, you know, from, from the West or from Europe. Uh, and that's uh, quite a bit later. That's three-fourths of a century after the pietist. Ziegenbalg. Z, it's Z-I-E-G-E-N-B-A-L-G. Bartholomew Ziegenbalg. He went to India, was very effective in ministry there for a long time. He, uh, he went sent by the uh, Moravian brothers, sent by the pietists uh, out of Franke's ministry in uh, Holly. And the Germans, of course, have created, uh, out of pietism, there are many, many mission agencies. Uh, do you know about uh, the Old Basel Mission? You ever hear that name, Old Basel Mission? Old Basel Mission, um, out of Württemberg, um, South Germany. Basel's just a little bit, Basel's in Switzerland, but it's on the border of Switzerland and uh, Germany. And um, between Basel and Stuttgart, you have this uh, large section of um, pietist territory. And it was really the center of the hotbed of pietist world missions. And uh, old Basel mission sent missionaries to Africa. Uh, Gottfried Osimensa was the former executive director for the Lausanne Committee for World Evangelization. Gottfried is a marvelous uh, African. And where did he get the name Gottfried? Uh, well, members of the old Basel mission came to Ghana, to his tribe. His parents were converted, and they named him Gottfried uh, in honor of the missionary that brought the gospel from the old Basel mission to their tribe. So he has his German name to go along with his tribal name, Gottfried Osimensa. Uh, this is very interesting. Um, there are other groups, the uh, Bloom Hearts, and uh, there's a lot of ministry uh, that sort of is not familiar to, I find. It was not familiar to me in many cases. Uh, but the Germans have been sending missionaries in many parts of the world for a long, long time. And they came out of Lutheran pietism, all over Africa especially. <laughs> Well, now we come back to England, and we're going to take a look at uh, the Wesleyan Revival, and uh, we, we get into evangelicalism hyphen revivalism. <laughs>
Uh, this is a whole new thing, really. But it, John Wesley is one of those giants of the church, and maybe the best book on Wesley, the best single vol volume, is the John Wesley volume in, by Albert Outler, O-U-T-L-E-R, Oxford Press. This is, this has got, is part of a series. It's got a lot of Wesley's um, da, um, most important writing, along with introductory essay by, I think, the person in this country who, by every standard, knows Wesley inside and out better than anybody else, the Outler volume. Outler has been teaching down at Perkins uh, in Dallas, which is one of the Methodist institutions. Um, Wesley touches all the bases. He was Anglican, of course. He studied, went across the water and, and tapped into pietism. And of course, he was reading Puritanism and, and in touch with all of that. Uh, you know the general outlines of his life, I think. He was. Um, a very serious, devout kid. His mother had about 20 kids. I think uh, he was, huh? Yeah. Uh, he And his mother uh, was once asked, um, who do you love most? And she, her answer shows a good bit of wisdom, I think. She said, whichever one is away from home until they get back, or is sick most until they get well. Um, but she used to make it a point to spend an hour a week with each of her kids, which I think is quite amazing. Uh, in fact, there's some, there's some evidence that she was so domineering as a mother that, none that not one of her children had a happy marriage. <laughs> um, and uh, clearly, Susanna Wesley was one of the reasons, I think. She just was so powerful in their lives that they never did have good relationships with other women. In fact, John Wesley went off uh, as, a, as a young man to be a missionary in Georgia, and he met a young woman named Sophie. And it was very, you know, they were engaged, and, uh, you know, she just gave up on him. Uh, he was just not able to carry on a good relationship, I guess, and so he came back. That was another, one of the number of reasons. I mean, he couldn't even make a friend, so he turned out... <laughs> turned out being uh, a little bit skewed by this mother. But this woman really is quite an amazing woman, um, Susanna Wesley. And of course, Charles uh, was in that family. And I think he was the 19th out of 20. I think often, if gee, what if they'd been born in the 20th century? There wouldn't have been no John or Charles, because there wouldn't have been a 14th or a 19th kid, uh, which I think they were, respectively, in that family, something like 14th or 19th. As a, as a child, he was in a burning parsonage. His father was a preacher, and he was rescued from the burning parsonage, and that marked him forever. If you see the Wesley movie, the movie on his life. By the way, I didn't mention the Martin Luther film, uh, which was made on his life about 20 years ago, is an extraordinarily good and accurate film. In fact, you, there's an introduction to it in one version by Rowan Bainton, uh, where he introduces, has a little preface to it, and then it's a full reel-to-reel -reel movie that was shown on national television and in theaters. Very historically accurate, wonderful film. Uh, the Wesley film that I saw is not quite as good, a little more melodramatic, not as long, but also uh, reasonably good. Um, to get you back into the spirit of this time. But one of the things it does show is, is the fire uh, and how he was rescued. And that always gave him, a, I think, a kind of sense of urgency and also a sense that God had kept him alive for a purpose. And he really always had that feeling. He went off to Oxford, and he had read John Arndt's True Christianity. He was a serious student, and he began to gather people into a sort of navigator Bible study. And they were called the Holy Club because, you know, they, they, uh, oh, holy. And they were so methodical about it that they were nicknamed Methodists. And that's the name that stuck. And it had nothing to do with the church. It was some Anglican kids at the university. I think Lincoln College 
uh, Oxford. And um, John and Charles gathered a few other students around them and just, uh, you know, just got into the Word every day about 4 o'clock in the morning. Got to remember they went to bed at 4 in the afternoon. I always used to get so guilty because <laughs> these, these people got up so early to get right with God every morning. And, and it wasn't until years later I realized they didn't have lights and they went to bed, at it, you know, before I have supper. So I stopped feeling quite so guilty. Um, he became, of course, pastor, was ordained Anglican, then went off to be an Anglican missionary with the new emerging uh, SPCK, the Society for the Propagation of the Christian Faith, and, and uh, went to Georgia, came back, and on that trip, of course, there was an enormous storm, probably just an average storm, but it was the only big storm he was ever in on ship, and he was terrified. In the midst of the deck, with the water coming over the uh, ship, Peter Bowler and the uh, Moravian brothers were having a prayer meeting in the midst of the storm, singing hymns, and you know they had to hang on to each other to keep from being swept overboard. But they were in perfect peace, and he was in abject terror, and he realized he wasn't converted. They were, and he really hungered to find out what their secret was. And they were coming to the New World to be Americans. Uh, and they were from Moravia. And they had been in touch with sweet and Pietism in Herrenhut, uh, uh, Zinzendorf's uh, ministry there outside of uh, uh, Germany. Zinzendorf may have been the most important German theologian between Luther and, um, and Kierkegaard. It's considered by some to be that significant. Uh, by the way, Zinzendorf was the first one to call the Trinity the family of God. A God the Father, God the Mother, and God the Son. <laughs> and some people were really offended by that. Uh, he was also one of those who, who put his heart religion into hymnody very graphically. And you, you suddenly get in the hymns a very emotional Jesus with the woundedness of the cross and all of those images of the blood uh, coming through. Uh, it was a religion that attenuated the pain of Jesus, the suffering of Jesus, and the personal love of Jesus for each person. So Zinzendorf really was an emotional uh, faith, clearly. Um, Wesley was visit. he was still searching, 1738, May 24th, quarter till nine, he was at a service at Aldersgate Mission, and uh, the pastor was reading from the preface of Luther's Romans Commentary. Most sermons I know at rescue missions don't start with things like the preface of Luther's Romans Commentary. I, <laughs> I imagine reading this, Aldersgate Mission, and this preacher, whatever his name is, is reading a preface to a a book that had been written by a German a couple hundred years before. And it was in the middle of listening to that Melanchthonian preface to Luther's Romans commentary, where Luther described his, his justification by faith experience and how that opened up the Book of Romans for him, that, Lu that Wesley wrote in his journal, My Heart Was Strangely Warmed. It became important, by the way, for Pietists to have a dated conversion experience. <laughs> a dated conversion experience. And Wesley dated his experience uh, of conversion, May 24th, 1738, quarter till nine, Aldersgate Mission. Hardly much doubt about that. Question? Yeah, and Methodists that I'm around, especially free Methodists, yes. would say that that was not at all a conversion, but the moment of sanctification. Yes, I know. He was a Christian oh, yeah. Well, I think they're probably right. I, I, think, uh, I think that's true. Yes, I, yeah, I, I graduated from Seattle Pacific, and I heard lots of Wesley stories in the six years I was there. Um, I crammed four years into six, like maybe some of you. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's probably true. I think the guy was a Christian, but he had no peace with God. He certainly... You know, he was not living a joyful Christian life. 
uh, he had not experienced what he was talking about. And he just, he feels, he, you know, he felt he was not a Christian because he was not living in the joy of, of faith and forgiven life. It was a little bit of Luther in him. But yeah, I think I know why they would make that the second blessing experience, sure. Um, well, um, what, um, I don't have much more to say about Wesley uh, specifically, except um, let me read. Here is um, uh, Methodist Church historian Fred, Fred Norwood. And uh, um, I thought he had said some really interesting things about Wesley in sort of compressed way. Uh, by the way, Norwood, who taught at Garrett here for years and years and was one of those people I was hoping to study with, but he retired. He did a two-volume uh, history. It's a book called Strangers and Exiles. And subtitle, A History of Religious Refugees. And the books are as thick as Calvin's Institutes. He starts with Abraham, the first refugee, and goes and documents all the refugee movements in the history of the world that he knows about, which is formidable. He did his doctoral research at Yale under Bainton. He spent his whole life working on this project. And that was one of the real life-changing books for me uh, in 1980. That was, I sort of have a book of the year, and that was my 1980 book of the year. It was, I carried it to Thailand, the two volumes. But I, when I began to realize that, God was moving refugees all over the world. The refugees are not victims. They are instruments of God in world evangelization. And uh, it was from that book that I had a whole different feel for the exile. God sent them into exile and incubated them there and then brought them back to renew Israel. And brought them back with whole new experiences and did the synagogue and all that. Took them to Alexandria, incubated them there. And he just kept going all the way through the history. And when, of course, the Marian exiles were incubated in Geneva, produced the Geneva Bible, got their act together, their identity. And when they hit the, the coast of Massachusetts, they were ready to, to go to work. You wonder where those energy, where that energy comes from, from exiles sometimes. And he, he really unpacked that for me. It was very, very interesting. Frederick Norwood is, um, is a fine historian. Well, the Methodist movement is seriously misunderstood if this requirement for entrance, that is conversion, is regarded as the whole content of the faith. True, Wesley was impatient with theological disputation and creedal rigidity, but he held firm to the central affirmations of Chris historic Christianity as it embodied as embodied in the tradition of the Protestant Reformation. Much of Luther and much of Calvin are to be found in the sermons of Wesley, although he was neither Lutheran nor Calvinist. Working with the societies and preaching from the pulpits when they opened to him, at other times, from platform of the countryside, he labored indefatigably, generally from around five in the morning to late at night. For many years of his life, was tumultuous, uh, for many years his life was tumultuous as opposition from on high. The clergy, and from down low, the unlettered mobs sought to silence or at least localize him. But as he had learned not to fear the storm, so he learned not to fear men. Some 225,000 miles, much of it on horseback, around and down between London and Bristol and Newcastle on Tyne and back again across to Ireland, up and down to Scotland. This comprised his work through the years until his 80s. Worn out when the French Revolution was sounding notes of a new world coming, he died in 1791. In association with his brother Charles and with Whitfield, who too became, uh, became too Calvinistic to work well with him, and with a small army of lay preachers and class leaders and plain men and women, John Wesley <coughs> sounded a great note of another kind of revolution, creating a new world of faith. Whitfield, who had his difficulties with Wesley, said, when asked if he would see him when they get to heaven, no, sir, I fear not, for he will be so near the eternal throne, and we shall be such a, a great distance we will hardly get sight of him. 
uh, which is a marvelously generous perspective, isn't it? Among the most important of the features growing out of the Wesleyan movement were the class and the lay preacher. And organized first in Bristol, the class soon became distinctive. It was composed of 12 people over whom presided a leader who should never be a traveling minister, but rather one of the number of the faithful in the local religious community. The leader was to meet each week with the members of his group and inquire after their spiritual and moral welfare, accept any offering they were moved to make, reprove sinners and backsliders, and exhort to greater perfection in the Christian life. Uh, let's see. Lay preaching was another special characteristic of early Methodism. Wesley himself had doubts until the evidence of results and the influence of his mother convinced him, and much of the success of Methodism on both sides of the Atlantic rested in the efforts of the dedicated lay preachers who filled in long periods when no regularly ordained traveling preacher was available. Um, let's see. Wesley added something to the tradition of Reformation just as he worked it out in the context of the Enlightenment. In justification, he emphasized much more the experience of being reborn into new life in Christ, an event or episode that could be measured and treasured. And beyond this lay the road to sanctification, the fulfillment of the promise of justification. Uh, Wesley was never quite sure what to do with this uh, doctrine, but he kept pushing the sanctification. Um, lots of um, things one could say about Wesley. Uh, he was not, you know, the kind of theologian of a Luther or Calvin. Uh, and his, his experience just led him step by step into whole new discoveries. Um, field preaching, for example. Um, he was, shortly after 1538 and his conversion, he heard about John Whitfield. And Whitfield was out preaching to the miners in the hillsides in Wales and uh, near Bristol in uh, uh, England. A place where if you ever go there and try to find it, it's very difficult to find, but just east of Bristol, a couple miles out on a hill, now still a hillside, but with housing somewhat around. <coughs> There's a pulpit built up on the hill, and it's called Hannam Mount. Hannam Mount was where Wesley and Whitfield preached to thousands and thousands of coal miners. Their face were so black, and at the end of the service, the writers would describe the streaks of white where the tears had run down their faces and cleaned their face of coal dust. And just this awesome, thousands of people with these tear stains running down these coal mining faces. Uh, but when Wesley first heard that Whitfield was out preaching, he wrote him a, a kind letter and said, Brother John, don't you understand? It's a sin to save a soul outside a church. Uh, and we just off map to think you could do that and that you should do that. Six months later, he was out there too because he had been thrown out. <laughs> the church uh, just kept closing pulpits to him because like uh, the pietists in Germany, he tended to be a little critical and the old Anglican establishment felt a little threatened and everywhere he went, there was, uh, uh, you know, there were poor people, riffraff showed up. And Wesley did add a new note and that was concern for the poor. He felt that the way up is down. It's implied in the incarnation that you go down and you are with those people. And so he did. And on horseback, he lived and he worked and he uh, went with them. Um, this is an extraordinary um, uh, career in ministry. Um, David Watson who is the director of covenant discipleship for the Methodist Church in this country and on the Methodist board in Nashville and a former professor of evangelism at uh, Perkins in Dal Dallas and a very close friend. We happen to be both officers in the Academy for Evangelism and Theological Education, which is a um, collection of um, professors of evangelism around the country and people who are serving in evangelism in one way or another. David. Uh, is full of Methodism. He is a Wesley fan. He was born in Newcastle on Tyne, uh, converted in uh, Wesley 
Wesley had adopted uh, a man to be his successor. He was discipling him, a man named John Fletcher from Maidley, which is uh, near Iron Bridge, not too far outside Birmingham. And um, that's a wonderful place also to visit if you're ever in uh, England. Um, I hope I keep tantalizing you. Do you want to go to some of these places? Maybe it's unfair. But to make a church history tour is not the same as an ordinary tour. To go visit Hannah Mount and sit on the mountain and read Wesley, or to go to Maidley and read Wesley, or to go to Cambridge and read Simeon. You know, these are the fun, walk the uh, St. Andrews um, High Street and, and go to St. Giles Cathedral and walk up to the palace and down to Hollywood House in the top up above uh, Edinburgh. And then read John Knox's flaming sermons that he delivered. You walk right by John Knox's house. Just go up on the porch and just imagine the Mary Queen of Scots trembling in the palace up there and all these people. It's a wonderful way to do church history. You ever get a chance. I've had to work at it hard because I didn't have the money to take normal tours. So anyway, it's kind of fun. Rent, rent a wreck. I took some students to Britain a couple years ago. We rented a wreck, an old <laughs> clunker in East London, and uh, drove to all these places with my students. It was Don Dayton went along. It was great fun because he's full, so full of Methodist stories. He, he's you know only he would know that Wesley drank 18 cups of tea every day, and uh, I kept wondering, you know, how you do that on horseback and <laughs> how often you have to stop and, and uh, you know all those things. But anyway. Have you seen a Wesley teapot? The one at his house is about this big. Okay. Um, Wesley's message, according to, um, well, do you know Bob Tuttle? He was from Ob uh, Oral Roberts University. He's written some things, including uh, some stuff on Wesley. Bob Tuttle is a friend. He's in town. He teaches now at Garrett, trying to teach evangelism in that, what I think, quite liberal institution. Uh, he... Um, he talks about the giant shoulders of John Wesley, his message. His approach was really to solve problems, not to define doctrines. He was sort of problem solver, very organized mind. There are reoccurring themes in him. God's sovereign will, prevenient grace, justifying and sanctifying grace, a kind of theology of the Holy Spirit. Uh, prevenient grace is universal, it's resistible. The Holy Spirit prepares people for ministry. There are three kinds of sermons that he mostly preached. To the unawakened, he preached on death and hell and the fact that he didn't think you wanted to go there. To the awakened, but not yet converted, he preached on faith. To the Christians, he preached on sanctification. In other words, he pretty much sidestepped his audience and had those sorts of sermons. Um, we'll get to D.L. Moody maybe tomorrow, but uh, D.L. Moody had eight sermons that he preached his whole life, I think. <laughs> I think he only had eight messages. He just preached them over and over again in every sort of way. Le Moody was a layman, and uh, uh, he just that's how he did it. Well, Wesley, I'm sure, didn't have new sermons everywhere he went. He just kept preaching these old ones. Faith is the I give up to the grace who's wooing us by the Holy Spirit. Um, there is a righteousness that is imputed. He is Lutheran at that love, but there's a theology of love, which is the fruit. And when God touches us, we really get, we get attracted to uh, uh, the righteousness of Christ. There's, there's much more emphasis on the subjectivity, the response to grace, than there is in Luther. Uh, the Holy Spirit enables us to overcome sin. It and, and it brings imparted righteousness to us. So clearly the righteousness of God actually doesn't, do, we are not just declared righteous. We in Wesley become righteous. We, we must, in fact, that's part of what uh, the sanctification is about, uh, to become, uh, to get r rid of sin. And he, he really viewed people as lost to sin, but forgivable, as susceptible to change, as vulnerable to fall, and as able to be perfected. Uh, Methodism uh, was not his goal. Methodism was something that was kind of an accident. It's like Luther. There's no way he wanted to do, to get out of the church, 
he wanted to reform the, the Anglican Church. And in his lifetime, until his death, there was no Methodist Church in England. He created chapels, not churches. They would build Methodist chapels all over England. The, the chapel movement was where the Methodist society was. And very, you may have seen pictures of these buildings. There'd be a downstairs and then a balcony that would go all the way around. It was sort of a, a community. And it was lay people gathering to study the Bible. It was sort of uh, to be inspired by these traveling preachers. In between times, they would meet in, in study groups. And David Watson's point about these study groups, I think, is very interesting. Um, he had some comments here. Um, the class meeting, as Wesley designed it, derived from the Moravians, were intensive experience groups. But when Methodism went out into the fields, the people couldn't get into the groups. So in 1742, class meetings evolved. They came to, the class would be the gathering of these uh, 12 people, and they would tell, they wouldn't listen to Bible stories, and nobody would teach them. Each person would have to tell what they were doing that week to prove that they were disciples of Jesus. It was an accountability group. Uh, how are you following Jesus this week? What are you doing? in your discipleship. What's new? And they'd go around the circle and each one would tell. Each one was accountable. These were accountability groups. These were poor people, minors, unlettered, often women as well as men, telling what they were doing for Jesus. Uh, and what it, how, how they were doing good, how they were avoiding evil, and how were they using the means of grace. Those were the three agendas. How are you doing good this week for Jesus? How are you avoiding evil this week? And how are you using the means of grace? What are the means of grace? Scripture, prayer, communion, uh, services, studies, etc. books you're reading, etc. Now, that's interesting because when we organize groups, we often put everything on a leader, and everybody in the group is passive, and we want to control it. David Watson who's this man at uh, National Board of Discipleship, is reinstituting the Covenant Discipleship Program of Wesley now within the Methodist Church USA. And he's going around getting churches to buy into this. And there is a Wesley renewal in this country now. I mean, if you can renew Methodism, that's really something, huh? <laughs> David Watson. This is David Lowe's Watson, L-O-W-E-S. And um, Methodist Board of Discipleship, Nashville, Tennessee. And David Watson is, uh, is reinstituting in this 20th century this Wesley pattern of accountability groups. They should meet only one hour, no more, because lay people are busy, uh, and often they were blue-collar people, and they were clock punchers. So. And they work hard all day, and they can't afford to come out and stay for long, protracted meetings at night. And so they would meet uh, after work, during work, before work, whatever. And they'd work, uh, and they'd meet one hour, no more. And each person would go around the room and answer these three questions. So he's producing materials uh, today, which are to show how that's being done. Any of you be interested in following that up, some of you? Let me give you his phone number um, in case you're interested in covenant discipleship. You'll know that we've been together. David Watson. Okay, 615-340-7000. Uh, Area code 615-340-7000. That's their new number at the board. And uh, ask for David Watson's office, and you could talk to him or to his secretary, and tell him you'd like to. You heard from me about this, and you'd like to get some materials, some examples of the co covenant discipleship ministry, and you might want to try some of this or take a look at it for your own benefit. But it certainly is a coming alive of Methodism in our own day. Watson uh, uh, talks quite a bit about. Uh, him. Uh, he was not terribly eloquent. 
but this class, he was so organized, so incredibly organized. Uh, what else can I say here? Um, let me just make a point about, uh, say something also about Whitfield. Whitfield was a Shakespearean actor. He is reported to have had the greatest voice in the history of Christendom. He was acting Shakespeare uh, when um, there were no microphones. And the lore about him, now Whitfield came to the United States eight times. There was no United States then, but he came to the colonies. And he did figure eights, you know, up and down the colonies. This is kind of like this. And he would start in the middle colonies, and he'd go up to Northampton, Massachusetts, to meet uh, uh, to Edwards. He'd go on down to the southern colonies and back and forth, and catch the boat back to England. He did that over and over again. On ship, <laughs> on, on board the ship, notice the, the ships in those days would, would not be huge, long ships, but no more than a couple hundred feet long. And there would be maybe a couple hundred people on the ship at the most. Every day, Whitfield would have divine service on shipboard. It would take six weeks to cross the Atlantic. And the report is that there was never an unconverted person who landed on shore. <laughs> there was absolutely no place to hide from Whitfield's voice on a sailing ship, which had no engines. His he would be there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean every day at noon holding divine service on ships. And you just can't imagine, but every time a Whitfield ship landed, there was a new batch of fresh converts turned loose in the United States colonies. <laughs> it was said of John Whitfield that his voice was so, magnif so good that he could actually bring tears to an audience by merely pronouncing the word Mesopotamia. <laughs> and that John Whitfield was the only preacher who could ever preach to 5,000 people on both sides of the Ohio River at the same time. Uh, I would just love to, I guess, have heard that powerful voice uh, proclaiming the gospel. Now, here was a Calvinist evangelist <coughs> preaching out there the grace of God, and uh, he was a revival like Edwards. Now, Someone asked Whitfield to compare Jonathan Edwards of Northampton to John Wesley in England, who never met. By the way, um, Edwards was a um, child of a uh, parsonage. His grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, was a great Puritan preacher. He went to Yale in 1702, and in 1721, he set out to become his grandfather's associate pastor. And then after about eight years, he became the senior pastor in that church. Um, in 1734, there were, a revival broke out in the Connecticut Valley. And Edwards wrote a book with the title something like um, the, the, let's see, surprising. Surprise, yeah, surprising work of God in the conversion of many hundred souls. Yeah. I love the titles of these ancient uh, writers. John Cotton's my favorite. He, his doctrine book for children was called Milk for Boston Babes of either England drawn from the breasts of both testaments. <laughs> Isn't that a great title? Uh, anyway. Um, you know, for a children's doctrine book, I mean, that's, that's kind of neat. Well, anyway, that book that uh, Edwards wrote found its way across the uh, Atlantic. That was four years before Wesley's conversion. And he read that book and was terribly impressed with Edwards and his reasoning, but it still hadn't quite, you know, converted him, or given him the second blessing, however we say. Um, he also had read um, uh, John Newton's, uh, um, no, Thomas A. Kempis' um, classic, Imitations of Christ. Um, well, so these books, 
were, and pamphlets were beginning to make their way back and forth so that conversions here were influencing over there and these stories were going. We, we know that. But someone asked Whitfield, who knew both Wesley and Edwards, to compare them. And I think this is interesting. Whitfield, who knew them both well, said, you could, you could put Wesley in Edwards' little finger. I mean, he was trying to show what a giant Jonathan Edwards was. Uh, and that's sort of the image he used. Uh, so Edwards was probably the greatest mind maybe this country has ever produced. Uh, he, I, I consider him and Thomas Jefferson the greatest mind certainly of the 18th century. Uh, they didn't know each other. But uh, I remember something John Kennedy said as president when he gathered all of the Nobel and Pulitzer Prize winners and all the famous artists in the country to the East Room of the White House and had a concert led by Pablo Casals, the cellist. And Wesley said, this is the most significant gathering of intelligentsia in the history of this country in this room, meaning the East Room of the White House, since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. <laughs> uh, which says something about the mind of Thomas Jefferson it was just incredible. But uh, uh, where these people came from, you know, where, why this burst of genius in the 18th century, the Wesleys, the Whitfields, Edwards, Jefferson, has stunned me. I, I wonder where those people are today, or we just don't know them. Are they in other fields? Uh, where are they? I, I keep wondering. Uh, I think I meet them from time to time, but uh, uh, just extraordinary uh, intellects and passionate and, you know, just uh, doing so much for the Lord. Well, um, the new element, I guess, in his preaching was this incredible passion for regeneration of souls, the spread of discipleship. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't at all defensive, but it was very urgent. And um, out of these ministries, these itinerancies of the Wesleys and the Whitfield, an evangelical revival broke out. Uh, people began to cry uh, out for salvation in huge crowds. And there, then many more joined it. Um, Salina, the Countess of Huntington, Hannah Moore was probably the greatest of the Methodist preachers. Hannah Moore, a woman. She was one of the founders of Keswick, <coughs> a ministry you may have heard about. She probably wouldn't be allowed to speak there today as a woman, but she was the greatest preacher that ever spoke there in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, this movement spread all through Anglicanism. It was really extraordinary. But um, it was over here in this country that Wesley's Methodism became Methodism. Methodism in 1978 celebrated their uh, 200th birthday. Uh, actually, by, uh, by the time of Wesley's death, he was still technically an Anglican, and his people were technically Anglicans. But in this country by then, should, you know what happened. Because of the war, the Tories tended to be Anglicans. And uh, so the Anglican Church was suffering terribly during our Civil War and early national period. So the Methodists basically broke. Francis Asbury uh, and others came out of Anglicanism and formed Methodist Church. And they brought the class meeting and the circuit riding frontier preaching to this country. And all the other churches stayed on the East Coast in their parishes. And over the mountains came the Methodists. And it was not an accident that the 19th century is American, is the Methodist century in this, in this country. The 18th century is Puritan. The 19th century is clearly the Methodist century uh, in every way. Uh, Methodism uh, influenced virtually every aspect of our national life. We'll come to that tomorrow. Back to England, I want to tell some stories about uh, other evangelicals and then, of course, say some things about evangelicalism. Uh, my favorite, or the most influential, of these 18th century, 19th century evangelicals was um, Charles Simeon of Cambridge. 
Um, Charles Simeon was an Anglican who went to King's College, Cambridge in the late 1700s, or mid 1700s. At um, age 23, he had finished three years at Cambridge, and he was walking among the poor in the town of Cambridge. Now, at that time, the enclosure laws were leading the uh, people to enclose the f fields with fences and pushing the poor farmers off the land. And they were flooding into the cities, pushed out by rural poverty and enclosure, and pulled by the new industrial revolution that was cranking up. Poor people were flooding into the cities. Well, Charles Simeon was a student who used to go walking in the streets among the poorest of the poor. And he was burdened deeply for these poor people, which is a Wesleyan passion to care about the poor. Um, there is a theology today, Ron Sider and many others have written about, called bias to the poor. The Bible is biased to the poor. God has a special love for the poor, and I think that's right. Um, I'm not biased against rich, but there is a biblical bias to the poor. They have a double jeopardy. They are not only sinners, but they're sinned against. And it makes them, their problem twice as difficult. Um, well, anyway, Methodism made its mark by going first to the poor, but then people like Hannah Moore, of course, were leading the duchesses of the government to Christ, too. So it, it did spread to the upper classes, but it really began, it went down, incarnation, down to the poor. It's the whole idea, leave your splendor, get down where the people are, and reach them in the coal mines and, the, and other places. So Simeon, being infused with this as a 23-year-old, was walking in the streets, and he saw the poor people, and he, he found an old church building, Holy Trinity Church, <coughs> and he stood in front of it and prayed, Lord, give me this church that I may preach to these people. Well, in a strange way, he was given that vicarage. He became a substitute uh, vicar. Um, it had no full pastor. It was a 700-year-old church, sort of almost dead. And Simeon went in there as pastor, and he decided he would go out and knock on the doors of the poor people. My name is Simeon. I came to inquire about your welfare. Are you happy? And the people were so stunned uh, at his um, coming, They'd so taken aback by it, that they actually... Uh, went out and uh, flooded to his church. Well, there was a paid pew crowd in the church. They, they saw this, this riffraff coming into their church. They were appalled. And so they quickly protested to the bishop to get rid of this young pastor who was ruining their church. The bishop was very happy that there was a little life there for a change. He decided to keep Simeon on. The paid pew crowd decided to take matters into their own hand. Uh, they went out, they locked their paid pews in the morning on Sunday, and they were high pews, so they couldn't be used. They went out and hired a guest lecturer who would preach to them on Sunday afternoons in the accustomed uh, manner. Simeon was getting paid 49 English pounds a year, went out and bought lumber and made benches uh, for the aisles and the foyer. Each Sunday he'd come, his benches would be in a heap, He'd dust them off and take them in and set them up and invite the poor in. This went on for 11 years. Simeon's philosophy during this time was, if half the people get double blessing, I'll be satisfied. In the 12th year of his ministry, there was a revival between the groups, and uh, the walls broke down, and he stayed ultimately 54 years as pastor of Holy Trinity until his death in 1836. Now, Charles Simeon, I read the biography of Simeon as a young student. I was 23 years old when I read this book. I was three years out, of, had been at Moody, and um, was in college, and found myself as the interim pastor of an inner city church in Seattle. And you can imagine what this did for me. I couldn't wait to get out and start calling in my, my name is Baki. I've, come to inquire about your welfare. Are you happy? 
and, and begin to experience the, uh, the same kind of thing. Uh, Simeon, I had grown up without a pastor. Simeon became my pastor. What did this guy do? He, he went to, he lived alone as a bachelor at King's College, Cambridge. Now, some of the achievements of this guy are that he, for five, he, he taught at the college his entire life and pastored the church his entire life. He, he started the first seminary in England by inviting students to study with him in his apartment. He was five times dean of the chapel. He's buried there in the floor. The, the tombstone is almost unmarked. It just says C.S. for Charles Simeon on the floor. He's buried right there in the sanctuary on the floor, under the floor of King's College, Cambridge. Um, he had many assistant pastors, such as Henry Martin, who went out with William Carey and worked with Muslims and translated the Bible into Urdu, died at age 34. Uh, Henry, um, Charles Simeon had a foreign mission vision, powerful vision for the world. When Charles Simeon heard, by the way, Charles Simeon had a rich father, he had a lot of political connections, and he heard that the way the British were going to get rid of their prisoners and overcrowded prisons was to put them on ships and send them off to Australia to be the colonists of Australia. He uh, went down to London to lobby to get uh, prison chaplains appointed to each ship, like Whitfield had done. And he got to appoint them personally. They agreed. So he staffed every ship with preachers so that every prison group that landed in Australia would be converted. And the Bishop of Sydney, Australia, uh, John Reed, who's a good friend with me, and I've done consultations twice in Sydney with him, um, he told me that the Sydney Archdiocese is the most evangelical to this day in all of Anglicanism in the world because of Charles Simeon. Uh, and that foresight, that vision to appoint chaplains and evangelists to go on prison ships to Australia. That, that isn't all. Uh, Charles Simeon preached and wrote. His commentaries are in the libraries here. You'd have uh, Charles Simeon's Bible outlines in the uh, Wheaton Library. So he wrote, he preached magnificently, he pastored the poor, he uh, touched the rich, he founded seminaries, he lectured at the university, and that isn't all. Uh, every month he got on the train, he went down to London, it's about 30, 35 miles, and he into the borough of South London called Clapham. It's just south of the uh, Thames River, central London, where he, once he got off the train, he met with a group of key people called, the, that have been nicknamed the Clapham Group, or Clapham Sect. It included Wilberforce and Hannah Moore, John Venn, the founder of the uh, Church Mission Society of the Anglican Church, William Pitt the Younger. William Wilberforce and William Pitt were members of Parliament. They met together for 50 years. Do you know why they met? To get a law passed through Parliament to stop the slave trade. Um, and they'd succeeded. It took them till 1807 to get Parliament to finally pass a law to ban slavery in England. They kept working. 30 years later, in 1837, they finally got a law through Parliament to ban slavery throughout the British Empire. This little group of half a dozen evangelicals saved England from a civil war. We had no such statesmanship in the United States at that time. This group is one of my models of how you influence a city, how you, you influence government policy. And, you know, I read this at age 23, and I said, you know, I have never seen this kind of pastorate that combined ministry to the poor, with the poor, parish and university, you know, scholarship and poverty, missions and local integrity, worldwide influence, and not only that, evangelism and social action, social justice. I've never seen anything more or since quite as significant as that combination. And so I made a vow uh, 
uh, to go to seminary. Um, and in fact, that book really drove me back to Chicago uh, and to further schooling. That is a pilgrimage, that book. So I have been touched by the revivalism of the uh, 18th century, 18th, 19th century, the Wesleyan, Anglican uh, movement that flowed into a book that's a dusty, dry biography called <coughs> Charles Simeon by H.C.G. Moole, written in 1896 and reprinted in 1947 by InterVarsity Press. In my book, The Urban Christian, I get, pay homage to Simeon in the preface. Because my book was writ just came out this last year on the 40th anniversary of the publication of InterVarsity's biography of Simeon. And I describe a little bit my debt to him. Uh, but again, this is one more example of how history informs who I am. It really has been life-changing. Uh, the Bible and then Simeon probably uh, was as formative as any other book I've read. Any, any person living or dead, uh, I, th I would have to say uh, probably Simeon ranks with my wife uh, mm -hmm. and parents on, on that kind of influence. Um, let me mention some others. Uh, Anglicanism was not only pastoral work, it was lay work. Let me tell you, I mean, I could talk a little bit about John Howard and prison reform and Wilberforce, his work among the poor, but let me mention a guy named Shaftesbury. Um, Lord Shaftesbury Earl, was named Earl Anthony Cooper. Um, Born 1801. He, um, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was an incredibly rich kid. He was also somewhat sickly, anemic, and had, he was almost um, a psychological basket case. Uh, his, um, his tenderness was really shocked one day. He was standing beside a cobblestone street and two drunken men were running a wheelbarrow down the street. It was bouncing along, and in the wheelbarrow was a, a pauper's body, just the body of a poor person. And he was taking this body to a pauper's grave. <clears throat> and the men were laughing, and the wheelbarrow was walking all over and bouncing. The body was flopping up and down, and they were really laughing. He watched this. Then the wheelbarrow hit a particularly uh, sharp cobblestone. And it flipped, <clears throat> and his body splattered on the ground. And the men laughed and laughed. And this 14-year-old boy was just horrified. And he made a vow. When I get big, you know, I'm going to do something about this, about the burial of the poor with dignity. And when he did get to be a uh, parliamentarian, uh, one of the things he did was uh, Victorian cemetery reform. One of the reasons that the Victorian movement built and beautified cemeteries uh, was their sense of the dignity of people even in death. Remember Mozart? Did you see that movie? Remember the grave scene? Um, that's about the same time. Bodies were just dumped, especially poor people. They're just dumped. In, into a common grave, and they would pour lye over it, keep the grave open till the next body went in. And they just piled bodies up there, and nobody cared about bodies. But these Methodists and evangelicals did. Oh, they did. Now, um, when he grew up, he decided that the issue he was going to work on was children. He became a member of Parliament, and he was horrified to discover that the English coal mines had 18-inch mine shafts, 18-inch, about like this, which means that only children could mine coal because only children would fit in the shaft. And so it took him 20 years to get Parliament to widen the shaft. They fought him. The coal company said, if you widen the shaft, it'll increase our costs so much we will never be able to compete with German coal. Uh, we will lose our jobs and the economy. We can't afford it. You know, all the arguments you ever hear 
be stuck with it, stuck with it, and finally he broke the back of the coal company. You know how he did it? He realized that rational arguments wouldn't, uh, wouldn't do it. So he got an artist to go and sketch the little children going down the mines. And the Victorian sensitivities were shocked when they realized that these little children were boys and girls and that the girls were topless, sort of pubescent girls crawling around with little pubescent boys in these mine shafts. And they were so horrified at the sort of sexuality of that, not at the economy, not at, you know, the dignity of children, nothing but the sexual <laughs> stuff. They finally stopped it. I mean, that's how he got the public to rise up and put a stop to it. Well, when they mined the, when they organized the mine shaft, I mean, when they widened the mine shaft, um, the children came out of the mines all right, but what were they to do? There were no schools for them. So he organized the, the ragged school movement, ragged school, where children with ragged schooling could come, ragged clothes. And this was the founding of the public school movement, which the British call private school. But this is their public school movement uh, for the common schools for the poor, which are, this is how it happened. It was an evangelical who was passed a law through Parliament, got some funding, and, and formed schools that were known as ragged schools because children in ragged clothing could come. This was a whole new outreach. Then, uh, Simeon got involved with housing, and then, of course, many of the poor people were dying of typhus and cholera, so he organized the London Water Board. For six years, they worked to drain swamps and deliver potable water to Dickens, East London, where people were dying of cholera and typhus. And um, when the Water Board went out of business, because they lost their funding, he uh, organized a banquet and thanked everybody, but by then they had already transformed and saved, who knows, millions of lives. And I'll tell you why it's millions. Because Shaftesbury designed a water and sewer system for London that was copied everywhere the British went. And the British built Calcutta, the British built cities all over Africa, like Nairobi, and wherever the British went, they copied the London water system. And if you've ever seen the way the Hooghly River comes into Calcutta through the Simeon-like water system, I mean the Shaftesbury-like water system, you'll understand that it was designed for a you know, few thousand, but it is serving a city of 10 million, not as well as it should, but uh, when you watch people bathing and, and every day in their local watering holes all through Calcutta, all where the Hooghly River, which is like the Mississippi, it's sort of dark brown, as Mark Twain said, too thick to farm and too thin to plow. But still, it's full of soil. But the people there bathe in it, and they do it. And it's a water system which has served Calcutta. But the model of that system was Shaftesbury's system. And this is a layman now. And he did all this through Parliament. He did it as a Christian. The theme for the water board was from 1 Corinthians. I've forgotten which verse it was, but it was from 1 Corinthians. And all these public works, you see, well, he founded schools, he got them out of prison, he, oh, prison. He, um, he like every Methodist and Anglican evangelical of his time, every layperson was expected to go to prison, to visit prisoners. It's the Matthew 25 ministry. Well, when he went to when he went to prison, he discovered that half the people in prison were not criminals at all. They were debtors, and they were mentally retarded people, and emotionally disturbed people. He came out of there so shaken, he founded the first mental health hospital in the world, in London, and created mental health facilities for people. He, one reason he, he did that was he knew that if he were poor, he would have been in prison. Psychologically, this man was nearly psychotic. He was neurotic. He ran a low-grade depression all of his life, and sometime, some periods of time, he was so freaked out 
that he couldn't even function. He would just disappear for months, even at one or two points, for years at, on end. And then he would show up again in Parliament tenaciously working on the bill that everybody else had forgotten about five years before. And, you know, he just kept hammering it. He just wore him down. And then he'd get, you know, psycho and depressed, and he'd disappear, and he'd, he'd go to prison and preach. He'd get depressed, and he'd come out, and he'd hammer away at prison reform. When he died in, uh, 1980, in 1885, we just celebrated the 100th anniversary uh, of the Shaftesbury Society uh, three years ago. The entire country mourned. His biographer, uh, Georgina Batiscom, makes this point. Uh, she said, nobody had transformed England as much as this one man, this evangelical man. He had saved millions of lives. And he had done it through public policy influence, doing it as an evangelical Christian, member of parliament. Focusing on the poor, it transformed also the life of the rich. And because the British at that same period were going over and colonizing India and other places, his influence has just been gigantic all over the world. Um, Georgina Batiscom. B-A-T-T-I-S-C-O-M-B-I-E. Um, it's called Shaftesbury. Earl Anthony Cooper, um, 1801 to 1885. It's published in Britain, um, probably in a Wheaton library. Should be. On the last page of that book, this bi magnificent biography, Georgina Batiscom closes with a speculation. <coughs> it's one of those what-if things that just tantalize. She says uh, something like this. Do you suppose that if he hadn't been depressed and psychotic, he could have done all these things? And she raises the possibility that because he was so, you know, so abnormal psychologically, that he had the stick to to stay with this agenda while everybody else ridiculed and went on to other things. And that so pricked me because people like that don't pass our assessment plans. They get screened out of navigator staff, <laughs> I think. They don't get to be, I, I guess, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's a couple of you around, right? Good. These are the kind of people, these are prophets. These are the kind of people that, uh, you know, get, don't get sent abroad as missionaries. They get washed out in the program. And I've just, you know, since reading that biography a few years ago, I've just become much more uh, aware that maybe when the world is so upside down and evil, when the, if the neighborhood is so god-awful, maybe successful, ordinary people aren't good ministers. Maybe we've got to find some of these screwed up, messed up people and give them the ball and stand and watch and build a support network. You hear what I'm saying? I, I, that, that story just really haunts me. I mean, that's very different from Simeon. Simeon was a together person, a kind of John Stott before his time. John Stott's a bachelor. John Stott's an incredible Anglican influence in the 20th century, the way Simeon was in the 18th and 19th. And I've worked with Stott a lot, and um, I have a very high regard for these people. They're just wonderful, godly, you know. I admire them so much. And um, so Simeon was together, but in his group was Shaftesbury. And that group of Hannah Moore and, and Wilberforce they worked with Shaftesbury. They created a support group for him and for each other. And that uh, says something else, too. Uh, I don't know if, how you survive in ministry, but I'm in a support group, and that's one reason I've been able to stay in ministry, particularly in the city. Uh, for the last 17 or 18 years, I've met monthly with a group of um, mostly men, not exclusively, we're from eight different denominations, not all of us pastors, um, 
um, the wife of the chairman of Amoco Oil Company is in our group. And we call ourselves Chicago Network. We have no officers. We have no budget. We meet once a month normally. Twice a year we go on retreats. Our monthly meeting is all day, six hours. Um, in the morning, our agenda is to go around the circle and check in. We pray with each other. We pray for decisions uh, that we're making. Uh, we lay hands on each other. We, uh, we interpret what we hear each other saying about our ministry, struggles, personal, professional, etc. The group knows me as well as my wife. Um, I wouldn't think of changing my ministry without that group's acknowledgement. When I left the pastorate, they worked through my uh, shift to a professorship in the Lausanne ministry. And um, that's been an incredible experience. We read books together. We're a growth group. We teach each other what we know. Most of what I've learned about the inward journey, I've learned from that group. Um, and I think probably most of what they have learned about world mission uh, in other continents, they've learned from me. It's a give and take kind of thing. Um, in the afternoon, we dream dreams for Chicago. We have invented things like Scoop, uh, Chicago Laity Networks, and the Christian Laity of Chicago. Uh, many of those ministries were just brainstormed and tested and prayed for and envisioned and strategized in that group. It's always something like that that's emerging. and. Uh, currently working on cities and schools reform and all sorts of things. And um, um, it's been just a stunning kind of a network. Uh, I don't feel alone in Chicago because I've got that group. If something happened to me, they'd be there. They would be there. They'd take care of my family the rest of my li their lives. Sure, they'd be checking in. It's a very, very close knit group. That's the reason I'm still in Chicago. I have had many in invitations to leave, but I've, we've made a commitment. We've made two commitments, one to each other, and secondly to Chicago. And we've learned that from the Clapham Group, uh, which hung in there for 50 years in Clapham, and also the Evangelical United Front, which was a small group that met together in New York City early in the 1800s. Arthur Tappan of Tappan Range and friends of Charles Finney, they met in the same way, in the same group for years. And they impacted, out of their little group came American Bible Society, American Board of Foreign Missions, American Sunday School Union. Not bad for one little group. <laughs> I mean, they just, they were a little group influenced by the Second Awakening in this country and abolitionism and many of those things. So my small group is very, very significant. And models for me came out of this evangelical support group. And our group started with two or three of us. And you build a group slowly. And then in May, when we have our first of our annual re retreats, we go to a home in Wisconsin on Lake Geneva that's been given to us for this occasion, which is far more than any of us could ever afford except the wife of the chairman of Amoco Oil who's in our group, who tools up there in her wonderful Lincoln, and it's all very interesting. The contrast uh, of, of pastoring the poor and connected to the Harris Bank and Amoco Oil, I mean, it's just, I could, you know, it's just so interesting how the Lord brings that up to happen. If you stay in one place and go down, I think the Lord blesses in those relationships. I think so. That's certainly my experience and testimony. But the inspiration to do that came from, uh, from, from this uh, model, first of all, of the Clapham Group. Charles Colson's been writing about it lately, occasionally in his Christianity Today columns. You've read maybe over the years, about a year or two ago, he had an article on Wilberforce and, 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 uh, and Shaftesbury and Simeon and that group. Um, let me say something now about the relationship of Methodism, evangelicalism, and social reform. Evangelicalism, revivalism, and social reform. Yes? Would you say some of the problems some Christian leaders have gotten in the years of days because they're so mobile and so without and, 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 
That is exactly, exactly right. No accountability group. Nobody knows them. They're running off jet setting, and I do, Lord knows, my share of coast to coast stuff. Um, but, you know, in May we calendar for the next year, and I have the dates of all next year's meetings in here, and my commitment is to be in town on those days. We're allowed to miss a meeting if our wife has a funeral, or if we have a funeral, <laughs> but we are really committed to be there. I mean, it's not a legalistic thing, but I wouldn't want to miss it, you know, because I really look forward to getting together. So uh, Bill Leslie and some of these people, we've been together for almost two decades now, more than two. And uh, it's, this, is, this is the spiritual, uh, you know, battle, uh, brothers and sisters, that leave you um, energized. Now, we, we really, we've, we've tried to get people to join this group, and we realize we have too much history and nobody else can quite jump in. I mean, it's very hard. We've had people come. We recovenant every May, and we have added some people. So we decided, a few of us, that we'd try to start a, a younger group. And Bob's been meeting with part of that group, um, a group that would we would say, don't imitate us. Let us tell you what we've been doing. And you just, you know, we'd like to testify that when we were about your age, we were burning out as Lone Rangers. And we found our own organizations and denominations couldn't help us because, you know, we have a work relationship with them. And how many times can you confess your sins to your superiors before you'll get exiled to Siberia, right? <laughs> 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 or maybe your organization is different than most denominations. But uh, we find that we can be pretty honest and brutal. And then in the fall, We'll meet in September, but then in October, we'll go back up there in the changing of the leaves, and um, we'll check in from the summer. And usually, I go abroad in the summer for three, three months or so, and this group prays for me every day, and they, uh, you know, it's just one of those support systems that you can't pay for. It's just incredible. So I would say, and the learning, again, I keep wanting to, to tie this history into application, contemporary. But if you picked up a book like Ken House, H-O-W-S-E, called Saints in Politics, which is another history of the Clapham group and their impact on England, you will see what I'm talking about. It's, it's a group of people getting together to pray and strategize, uh, and out of that comes power and influence. And it's not that you seek power and influence. You just seek to be faithful to God and supportive of each other and nurturing one another and so on. What was that book, um, Saints in Politics? Saints in Politics by House, H-O-W-S-E. It's also published in England. I think it's probably available here in a library somewhere. It's not a common, ordinary bookstore. <laughs> but, but it's about the Clapham group. It's very inspiring reading. Okay, yeah. Oh, you, you know, I just realized we've gone over time. I'm sorry. Let's, yes, let's, uh, let's do that and uh, come back. I'm sorry for this last part, much of which will be, uh, uh, I wanted you to get into groups and uh, do some sharing.